and we are still in vector calculus, but we are now ready to get to integral vector calculus. And same thing, we really have like in a physics class, we got two uh, big questions. Which is, we want to integrate vector functions and I'm just going to really stress that there are many different ways of doing this, integrals of vector fields. And at this point, hopefully the notation's kind of comfortable where a vector function is R to R3 in 3D and a vector field is R3 to R3. So classically, you would imagine that you have um, a point in space you tell me a point in space, I tell you the vector that lives there, like the electric field or the magnetic field or something like that. So integrals of vector functions you've been doing since mechanics, um, and they're pretty easy. So let's just take, for example, um, a pretty straightforward vector function, like the acceleration is a function of time. So the game is you tell me like 10 seconds and then I tell you the acceleration of some particle or maybe it's center of mass or something like that. And of course that would be three different component functions, a x of t, x, a y of t, and a z of t. And a good physics question of course is, well, what's the velocity as a function of time? And you're like, well, that's just integral a dt. So that's correct. That's notation. That's notation to the point where kind of, you know, this is the first time you've ever seen it and you only had a single variable integral calculus. So you'd be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me, but like, what are you actually doing? So what you're actually doing, of course, is integrating the individual component functions, each of which is a scalar. So writing it all out, integral ax t dt, integral a y of t dt, and integral a z of t dt. So, you know, clumsy, gritty, but not a problem. Um, specifically, what we want to do most of the time, because just like a single variable function, if I integrate, I have a free integration constant. Um, which has to do in this case with my initial velocity at time t naught, we usually look at definite integrals. So specifically, I have an integral from, let's say some initial time t naught to tf, a of t dt. And then dot, 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 you know what it means. What does this actually tell me in words? You're looking at the total change in acceleration between two points in time? Yes, so it's the change in between two points in time, but because we integrated acceleration, the physical quantity whose change we computed is the velocity. Velocity, and it's a vector. So there are three ways that we can denote that. Just realize that, you know, um, depending on whether or not it's ambiguous, you'll see different notations. From elegant to less elegant, what this is is a change in velocity. And it's a change in velocity in between the final time and the initial time. So uh, keeping my noughts and f's, vf minus v naught, or if I really wanted to like make sure everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about, and I want you to spend as much as possible on a textbook by using as many symbols as possible, I would write it like this. Um, and if I wanted to even go crazier, I could write it out in components. So that would be change in the x component of the velocity over that time period, change in the y component of the velocity over that time period, change in the z component of the velocity over that time period. Okay, so each of these is true. Just realize, you know, depending on, I guess, how much the person who's writing stuff and more and more that'll be you guys trust their reader to understand them. You could see any of these possible notations from elegant to kind of clumsy. Okay, honestly, that's it for integration of 
uh, vector functions. It just comes down to the techniques. Like if one of these things is a hyperbolic arc cotangent or something like that, you know, so be it. You got to go hopefully find it in a handbook or online or Wolfram Alpha or, you know, just write it as a formal expression. Boring. So here we go with vector fields. Um, and vector fields, of course, as that comment suggests, there are many different ways that we could do this. And our favorite ones will be uh, contour integrals, volume integrals, and surface integrals, because we have one, two, three possibilities for the number of variables we can integrate over. Okay. So now we have vector fields. And because some vector field, I'll call it W, just so we're not really leading, is three real numbers in, three, three real numbers out. And again, because we're a physics class, we'll think about this as the dimensionality of our space. Could be 1D, 2D, 3D. What these will be are line integrals or contour integrals. surface integrals, and volume integrals. And, you know, don't get complacent because even a line integral, if you specify a 1D thing, think about like a wire, you can twist a wire in such a way that it actually makes a 3D shape. So it can, a line integral could potentially go through um, or use all three of our three dimensions. So that's why this is a little bit tough. So specifically for a line integral, and we'll just keep it to Cartesian for now. I have a little differential element, so we'll call it dr. And my little differential element could go in the x, y, or z directions. I'll do the usual way of writing that. So we could move a little bit in the x direction, we could move a little bit in the y direction, and we could move a little bit in the z direction. And so each of these has a magnitude and a direction. So imagine I could draw in 3D, there's like some um, tiny little vector. It's a vector, truly speaking, it transforms like a vector, um, but it's just of differential magnitude. So this is a vector and it transforms accordingly. If it reflects, if you reflect the coordinate system or rotate the coordinate system into a new basis, you've got to do everything that you do to a normal vector to that, for instance, if you're in a proof. Okay. So our first um, task is let's just write out the possible things that we could do with our cool little piece of DR and figure out like what sort of things they are. So let's say that I have a function f. Right, so it doesn't have a vector hat, it is a scalar function. And I got two questions. What do I need to specify to get a number or vector? And sort of giving things away. Um, and what is my result? So if I integrate f dr, f is a scalar function, what sort of uh, mathematical object do I get out? Is it a vector or a scalar? That would be a scalar. So. Oh wait, is f a scalar also? F is a scalar function. Okay, then it would be a vector. Exactly. So what this is is kind of like k r. I have a scalar k and a vector r. So that's scalar multiplication of a vector, which produces a vector. All that we've done is we've upgraded k to a function itself, but it's a scalar function. And we've kind of, I don't know, downgraded, if you want to think about it like that, 
r as r from a vector with finite magnitude to a differential one. So this actually produces a vector. Okay. And then we could also have another thing that we could do with the r. We could take a vector function v and we could dot it with dr and we could take a vector function v and we could vector product across it with dr. So integral v dot dr, what does that make? Right. <laughs> you guys hearing the weird drilling in the background? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, OK. Hopefully it's not too distractive. Um, so this makes, because uh, we got a dot, this will make just a scalar. And then integral v cross dr, because that's the vector product, that will, of course, make a vector. OK, so what these things have in common, though, is that if I were to actually get a vector, like a fixed vector with three components, or a scalar, just some single real number, what is it that I have to specify to make that the equivalent of a definite integral? So which is to say what goes like here? The analog of my limits of integration. You have to specify what path you're taking. Exactly. So you have to specify the path or the contour. And this is true for all of these. Okay. And the problem with this as opposed to single variable calculus is if I want to get from point A to point B, how many possible contours do I have to do it? An infinite number. Yeah, an infinite number, which, you know, makes life interesting. Um, and there's going to be a connection in between these. I won't draw the, um, I won't try to draw a vector field. I'll just show you guys something on Mathematica after we go through an actual example. And this is important. You usually aren't given stuff, in, at least in the beginning of your physics education, where they're different. You deal with what are, so, what are called conservative vector fields or forces. Um, so there is a criterion for when the integral is path independent. But don't get complacent because there are vector fields for which the contour does matter. So one of the things we'll do with our theorems of integral calculus is come up with a really great criterion for when the when our contour integrals are path independent and when they're not. And when they're not, you can honestly just pick the easiest possible contour, integrate once and never integrate again. Okay. So I know you guys have seen this at some point in your life, but you know, imagining the summer is long, so it's worth doing a little bit of rust shaking. So let's do this. And I'll do a contour as kind of a warm up, and then you guys can do a second contour and see what sort of vector field we find. So just take plain old ordinary x and y axes, and let's not make life too hard for ourselves and just go in between the point. 0, 0, and 1, 1 for some vector field. So our goal in this example is to calculate integral f. So I am, you know, it's OK if you think about it as a force. It's kind of what I had intended.
and we'll go from the origin to 1.1, one, one, which of course doesn't specify as much information as we need. And this is a 2D vector function, so we're not going to cause ourselves too much trouble, but we are going to make it kind of an interesting one. And then I'll do contour one, and then you guys can do contour two. So I don't know, just call this contour one. Okay, and I'm not gonna draw it, but what you should of course think about is like everywhere in the X, Y plane, I pick a point, there's a vector, an arrow that lives there, right? So this thing should be, the X, Y plane is bristling with arrows. And we'll do the first contour as um, down the street and up the avenue. And we'll label the paths, path one and path two. Okay, so contour one is along one, then along two. So what this really comes down to is specifying a so-called parameterization of the contour and realizing that even in single variable calculus, if I was gonna break an integral into two parts, so like it's kind of a sidebar, um, let's say that I had a piecewise continuous function, I had a downward sloping line attached to a parabola, I would just integrate the first part and then I would integrate the second part and I would just add them together, right? So this insight still holds. If I want the total integral area under the curve, I just do the first part and then I add it to the second part. So we'll integrate contour one and then just add it to contour two. Okay, so contour one would then be integral f dot dr, we'll call it c1 along path one plus path two. And then I will just split that up because you know, why not? So along path one, I have integral along path one. And then first, let me just dot everything out laboriously. So I have fx, Fy, and then I have dx, dy. And then fx is minus y. Right? So the y part. So I have integral, and I still haven't specified how I'm going to do this contour. So that's the so called parameterization part. But I have minus y dot with dx. So that's pretty funky looking. And then I'm adding to that because this is a scalar product. So I can just distribute the integral over that. Integrals and derivatives are distributive over addition. And that's x squared dy. So that looks kind of funky, but that's just literally using the definitions and the symbols like 100% literally. Okay, so how on earth am I gonna do this? Well, first clue is that here I have an integral over dx. So my limits must be over dx. So for contour one, what x do I start at and what x do I end at? Zero and one. Yep, so I start at zero and end at one. And then for y, what do I start at and what do I end at? Zero and one. So just along then, the first path. Oh, yes. zero. So I start at zero and end at zero. So this, you know, don't make trouble for yourself. I started at zero and I end at zero. How much area do I have under this curve? Provided the integrand doesn't blow up, which it doesn't. 
None. Nowhere. Yeah. Life is great. So this whole thing is zero. Uh, everything's turning out okay. So, all right, the last thing to do is like, what is why? So this is the parameterization part. And if we're just walking like down the block and up the, um, up the avenue, these are lines of constant X and constant Y. So this is just kind of a warm up for the mechanics of doing these. You might have a more difficult um, parameterization. I'll draw one after we finish. Okay, what is true about Y along path one of this first contour? Y is equal to what value? Zero. Yeah, so now I'm just crossing out the Y part, but that's zero. So this is really nice. I'm integrating zero over a finite domain, and I'm integrating something that's not zero, possibly complicated, over a zero domain. So that's zero plus zero equals zero. Great, so we'll just remember that that's zero. I don't think that's too hard to remember. And then give you guys a second. Okay, the miracle of working on a whiteboard like this is I can just change this and then we'll do contour two. Voila, that's two, that's two. Sort of. And then I do that with contour two. I kind of end up back where I started because I still have fx and fy and I still have dx and dy. Um, so I still have minus y dx and then I still have minus x squared dy. But now what's true along contour two, what's true about my limits of integration for x? I start at what and end at what? One to one. One to one. And then what's true about my limits of integration for y? Zero to one. Zero to one. And then, you know, we could just toss the first term right now, but just to, you know, one extra little piece of practice for the parameterization part is essentially what we're looking for when we look for a parameterization is or if you're Canadian parameterization, um, y is a function of x. So we can throw that in there and then we have just a function of x with limits of x and dx. And then it just turns into a normal calc two kind of problem. Um, but in this case, you know, they're kind of trivial functions. So what's true about y along contour or path two of contour one? Good. I like the silence. It doesn't have a single value, right? So we'd have to figure out how to parameterize this. It's, it goes from, um, from zero to one, but it does so at an infinite rate of change, which is kind of spooky. But that's what we would be, in theory, looking for. But we're saved by the fact that, of course, you know, there's no area under this curve because we're doing it over an infinitely small domain. So just like before, this whole thing goes to zero. Okay, um, now what we're looking for is, you know, possibly trivial, but we're looking for x is a function of y, so we have limits of y, integrand is all y's, and then dy. So what's true about x along path two of contour one? It's constant. Yeah, it's constant, and specifically the constant value it takes is just Uh, one. Yep, so it's always equal to one. So finally what we get is integral zero to one, one times dy, and that's an integral even I can do, I think. So we have one. Okay, so we'll save this and put it up here. The integral along contour one, so in our little sidebar, integral along C1, f dot dr for this particular force field. So you guys can say force field now and like know exactly what it means. So force field is one. Okay, any questions about that? OK, 
Okay, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes and you guys can do contour two. Um, before getting an answer, and we didn't visualize the vector field, but you know, if you squint at it, it does look a little bit funky. Um, do you guys think that the integral from zero to one along contour one and contour two, which is specified by this, so we're gonna go now instead of down the street, up the alley, up the alley, and then down the street. So it's really just a trivial permutation of these two paths. So we just do them in opposite order, but I'll call them three and four. So I'm not like leading at all. So now we're going along contour two, which is path three and then path four. Uh, I think that's gonna be the same or different. Uh, I think it's gonna be the same just because I remember learning that like work um, is like conservative or like path independent, but like that's just a guess. Yep. So what you're going to learn in this example is that you guys were given works of only so-called conservative functions. So you were completely unable to do um, problems with work and friction unless, you know, you treated it as friction as a leftover or more importantly, you weren't able to do any fluid dynamics. So something with circulation, it might be different, but I'll leave you guys to work it out. And you'll see this is your first example of a non-conservative quote unquote force field. And they're out there. You were just, um, you know, you weren't allowed to mess with them in 1210. Anybody need more time for contour three? Okay. Okay, so, um, you might see this at some point in your life in brackets. I didn't want to do this at first because, you know, it kind of gives away the answer. You can specify a contour like this, either just literally y is a function of x or x is a function of y, or in this case, um, the fact that over contour 3, x is always 0, and then y goes from 0 to 1. Okay, so that's our, that's our contour for 3. Um, what do I end up with after I integrate this? Got negative one. The whole thing? Yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. So the contribution should come from the four integral. So for the three, I think you get uh, zero. So x is zero, which kills this. And then dx is zero. So dx doesn't change, so that kills all of this. So along contour three, dx is zero, first term gone, and then x itself is zero. So just the part three is zero, and then the minus one is correct, but that comes from the, the second integral part, which is path four, leg four, I don't know what you wanna call it. And then I'll write that out. So in this case, y is equal to one, always equal to one. And then x goes from 0 to 1. So that's one way of writing the contour out. Um, and then we still have the same integrand. And now we have to do more work. So in this case, the whole integrand here is minus 1, because y is 1, and then we got that minus sign, and then the x goes from zero to one, but what's true about dy, so y never changes, so that means that this is um, an integral over zero domain, so no area under the curve because the base is zero. And then we're left with integral of minus one dx, and then x goes from zero to one, so I can do that integral, that is minus one, and then we add them all together and we get that the integral along contour two, not contour one, integral f dot dr is equal to minus one. Okay, holy crap, that's pretty weird. So this is an example of a non-conservative force.
Okay. And what that means is that there exist two paths. such that integral along contour one, f dot dr, and we did a 2D example, but in general, the force field could be in you know, 3D or however many dimensions you really feel like, for which this is not true. Okay, why have you guys not been messing around with non-conservative forces and contour integrals and showing that they're non-conservative by doing this? Well, because these are any two paths. So you could have a million paths for which this equal sign holds. And then there's just one nasty path for which it's not true. So I really just need a counter example. The real miracle is if you think about how to show something as a conservative force, well, how on earth would I know something is a conservative force? I would have to check all infinite paths for all infinite pairs of points. So the fact that we know conserv forces are conservative in general means that we're not checking paths. There's going to be a theorem of vector calculus that will do this for us. And it's not going to involve integrals. It's going to involve derivatives. So we really love it. And in one shot, you can show that something's conservative. So that's just kind of a, um, a preview of what we're getting into with the vector calc theorems, unless you've seen it before, like Stokes and Gauss. Or you may have seen it before, but they didn't really talk about the application to conservative forces. Okay, so that's caveat one, is that path matters unless you show that the thing is conservative, a conservative vector field, which we'll get to by the end of next week. Caveat two is that we were totally in rectangular coordinates. And let's say that, uh, for instance, I was in non-rectangular coordinates. So warning one is that non-conservative fields exist. If you don't know it's conservative, you got to use the specific path that you were given. Okay, until it's shown to be a conservative field, no shortcuts. And then warning two, is that in non-Cartesian coordinates, dr is different. So specifically, dr in Cartesian coordinates is dx i hat plus dx dy j hat plus d z k hat, but then what would be true in, for instance, um, polar cylindrical? Or starter question is that why can't I just do this? In polar coordinates, I have d rho, and then I have d theta or phi, and then I have dz. So those are cylindrical coordinates, right? So like the differential is an operator and like the rho theta, and well, I guess c is the same, but like the rho and the theta are like, um, they're not, you don't just pick them at random, you like pick them via certain relationships to the Cartesian coordinates. Um, which aren't um, they're just like an equal sign. There's like an, like there are some functions there, so you need to like actually evaluate how the differential operator like interacts with those functions, and like do the product rule a couple times. Yep. So that's how you'd find them specifically. Um, exactly right. So I know that something's fishy about this. What's true about the units? And you can use SI units of dx, dy, and dz. So the units of these would all be what? meters meters and the units of the unit vectors somewhat ironically are unitless unit vectors are unitless so <laughs> d rho is okay at least the units check out dz is okay the units check out but what are the units of d theta
Radians. Radians. So it turns out that, you know, we'll show that this is true. But units are wrong if we just put our coordinates down. So the coordinates are not necessarily the things that you use for um, the line element or the surface element or the volume element. And for specific coordinate systems, namely the three that we'll use, and then we'll talk a little bit about like super exotic ones um, when we get there, is that it's not necessarily just, you know, the coordinates themselves. And dimensional analysis gives you a, a clue as to the fact that that's the case. So that's warning number two, and we'll actually completely deal with both of those warnings. So we'll come up with the theorem that tells me whether or not a function or a force field is conservative or non-conservative. And then we'll also come up with um, expressions for line surface and volume integral elements for exotic, funky coordinate systems. Okay. So that's kind of it for line integrals, right? And again, we'll revisit both of those warnings. So now on to surface integrals. So we need a differential element of some sort, which is to say the equivalent of dr. And I'm going to draw it in a second. I just want to do the typing first. So there's a thing, you can call it a little area piece. Um, technically, they're called plaquette. And it turns out that they have uh, size and they have orientation. And therefore, what this thing is, is a vector. So a little piece of line is a little piece of line. It might point in all three of my three directions, dimensions. Um, for a surface, I need a little piece of surface. So imagine that as something like this, you know. Um, somebody gives you a surface like a, you know, we can't really do it with a balloon, but imagine uh, kind of like a sheet or, you know, a sheet of metal is a really good thing to visualize. So a curvy sheet of metal. And you take a razor blade and you cut a teeny tiny piece out of it. And what we're going to do is at first we're going to call it d sigma. And then realize that this has a size, you know, like the number of meters squared that this plaquette is. But then also to do our um, various operations, we're going to actually also include an orientation. So a real differential element of area is actually going to be this thing. And that's the box to indicate that there's this is coming off normal to the surface. So it's d sigma, and d sigma is a vector. And d sigma has the following two properties. So the magnitude of our differential element is the tiny bit of area. And you could think about that as dx times dy in just co uh, Cartesian coordinates. So it's got the right units, it's meters squared, but then also it's got direction. So d sigma, the normal vector, so we've gotten rid of the magnitude, the area, uh, points normal to the surface. Okay, what's the little bit of a problem I have with this? So I have a little plaquette, this little piece of, you know, surface It's in my hand. Imagine there's a small piece of paper or something like that in my hand. Um, what are the possibilities for the normal to that surface? I guess the other way of saying it is, is this completely unambiguous? The fact that I drew this, so this is what d sigma with a hat on it or a vector symbol on it is. It's the vector that points normal to the surface and its magnitude is the area of this little plaquette. Was this the only possible way to draw the normal to the surface? Nope. What's the other way of drawing the normal to that surface? 
on the opposite side of the surface. Exactly. So we have an ambiguity. So we could go down or we could go up. So this is ambiguous. And we have two ways of resolving the ambiguity. So the first way of resolving the ambiguity is if we have a closed surface, you can always have it point outwards, right? So that's the easy way of doing it. And that's, um, you know, in e &M, you'll probably, you won't get too much into the mathematical details. You'll just always have normal point out of the surface. So first way is that for a closed surface, think about a balloon and it could be, you know, give it to a clown, make some arbitrarily weird shape of the balloon, but it's a balloon, so it's closed. So you get something like that and imagine that this is, you know, closed. This is really stressing the limits of my drawing. Something like that. See what I'm trying to say? Don't judge me. Um, so in that case, the normal would be out. So D sigma hat would point out of the surface. And then here D sigma would point out of the surface, normal to it. And then here on the back, D sigma would point out of the surface. Okay, if we don't have a closed surface, we have a second way of resolving this, which is the same way we resolved ambiguities with the cross product, is we could actually have two coordinates and they have the right units. We'll call one uh, S1 and S2. So there's DS1, first coordinate, and DS2. If, um, you know, if you want to think about them as just X and Y, you're, that's fine. So I have DS1 and DS2. The cross product actually has all of the properties of um, the differential element in the blue writing, is that if we just define DS1 cross DS2 as D sigma, we get everything that we want. So which way does D sigma point? It points in an unambiguous direction given by the right hand rule. And then what's true about the magnitude of a cross product? Don't worry about the fact that it's differential stuff. We want a differential. This is the area of the parallelogram that's spanned by S1 and S2, DS1 and DS2. So this has all the properties we want. You know, most generically, this is how you can define something for an open surface without having to like write a description afterwards. So this is great. Don't, don't. Okay. So for this, the way that I drew them, um, <laughs> you know, I guess words would kind of do okay. Which way would D sigma, the differential of the surface point for these two guys, DS1 and DS2? Yeah, it would point down. So S1 cross S2, I guess, would be that way. Okay, so this actually has everything that we need. Okay, that was a little bit harder than defining just dr. And also surface integrals are really, really hard. And so we usually only use them in proofs and examples of like really high symmetry like Gauss's law. Okay, but any questions about what d sigma is? Okay, okay so we'll now pull the same stunt and we'll say, what are the possible things that we could do with d sigma? And again, the notation is meaningful, just lowercase f is a vector function. So we have f d sigma and then Okay, what sort of thingy does f, sorry, f, yeah, f d sigma, what does that produce and what do I need to specify? Sigma 
So ft sigma produces a vector, and you would need to specify the contour. Yes. So in this case, the the contour is in like the total shape. Um, the term you use if it's 2D, because this is a 2D integral. So contours are reserved for line integrals. So you would need essentially a 2D contour. So we'll just call it a surface. It's one of the few cases where we didn't invent new terminology just to like mess with you. So you need to specify all the details of the surface, the 2D surface, exactly. Okay, I'll leave this up to you guys. There are two other really useful things that I could do with D sigma in physics at least. Uh, any guesses about what they are? You could take a some vector field defined on the surface and take either the dot product or the cross product with that, Exactly. That is both of them. So these are both useful. And I'll just call it S for surface. For both, I need to specify a surface of integration. So the 2D equivalent of a contour. And then this produces, I got V dot D sigma, so that would be a scalar. And then V cross D sigma would produce a vector. So these are the useful things that we can um, compute. Uh, we'll just go right to physics. Have you guys taken ENM yet? Or is that on the docket for, you have, great. So yeah, ENM. Uh, 12, 20? Yeah. yeah. So this is stuff that should at least like kind of ring way back machine bells. Um, and the more you see Gauss's theorem, the better off you are, <laughs> Gauss's and Stokes. Um, so we'll do an example with Gauss's, uh, sorry, Gauss's law. So Gauss's law, not Gauss's theorem, looks like this. So this is type integral of type two. E, the electric field, is a vector field. We're going to dot it with surface elements, and we're going to integrate it over a full surface. And this means it's a closed surface. Uh, you can see this on line integrals, contour integrals too. If there's that circle on the integrand, it means it's a closed loop. So it ends where it starts. And let's see if, how good the retention of 1220 is. Um, and I'll never forgive your 1220 instructor if you guys don't all say this in unison. What is the closed surface integral E dot D sigma equal to? I think it's zero, right? It, in a lot of cases, it is. Okay. You can manufacture cases that are pretty important where it's not equal to zero. Okay, so this is good. So we can, wait, there's a unmute. Uh, if Q enclosed divided by epsilon huh? Yes. So it's the charge enclosed in the closed surface and then physics constant. Okay, let's draw this because it's like super important. I'm just gonna put some charges here and I'm gonna draw a really crummy set of electric field lines. Um, do electric fields have a color for you guys? Like there's a synesthesia thing that a lot of people have. I would say red for electric fields, blue for magnetic fields, but okay. I don't know. Yeah, do green, blue, but we'll do red. I'm green, blue. Green, blue. yellow, blue. Yellow, blue. Okay, so we all agree that magnetic fields are blue and that's great. Um, so I think maybe orange is kind of in the middle for everybody, but we'll do red. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll probably end up doing a couple of greens before the end of the quarter. Okay, so here are some electric field lines. Um, And here is charge one, charge two, and charge three. So Q1, Q2, 
and Q3. Um, can you tell me anything about the magnitude, positive or negative, of Q1, Q2, Q3? From the field lines, it looks like Q1 and Q3 are negative and Q2 is positive. Yep. So this is the important part, is that negative charges are sinks. They eat magnet or electric field lines. And positive charges are sources. They create electric field lines. So I see Q2 creating electric field lines. They're coming out of it. That's positive. Q1 and Q3 are eating electric field lines. I'm going to draw two contours because I have a 2D chalkboard. Imagine that these are like kind of closed bubbles. This is the best I can do. So let me draw this first contour. And then let me redraw it because I'm off the up. Okay. Now I'm going to count. This is a funky curve. I did not do this with any sort of premeditation. But let me count all the electric fields or electric field lines that are going into it and coming out of it. So we have one leaving. We have two leaving. We have one entering. Um, OK, we have another one entering. I just got to, yeah, I didn't draw it far enough. Right. Um, I have another one entering, I have one leaving down there, I have one leaving down there, I have one entering here and one entering there. And I add them all up, I have four leaving, four entering. They add up to zero. In fact, I can draw any contour I want, as long as I don't enclose a charge, I'm always gonna be zero. So that's the zero that you're probably remembering. What is the only way to get a net flux into or out of my surface? My surface needs to do what? Move. Yeah, it's got to move until, I, mean, I could like kind of bubble it out here or something like that. And I would still have those two in and those two out. I've got to move it so that what is suddenly true. I've got to move it so that it does what? It's supposed to like pass through a charge or something? Yeah, so the only way to get any surface integral whatsoever to have net flux is what this left-hand term is, integral e dot d sigma. The only way to get net electric flux is to enclose a charge. And I'll draw like a really simple example where you can see that. So yeah. OK, so now I have one, two, three, four, five electric field lines entering. So that's the, the philosophical content of Gauss's law. The cool thing about this is also the terrifying thing about this is that I can like warp this bubble as much as I want. I could like bulge it out and bulge it in and I could make it like really goofy looking. And this is a surface integral that in no way I would want to compute, but it still has five field lines puncturing it. And it would tell me that Q enclosed is equal to Q3. So there's a lot of like amazing kind of philosophical content in Gauss's law. There's a theorem of vector calculus that sits underneath it, which is what we'll talk about ultimately. But a lot of times you're like, yeah, I really don't want to compute that integral. So we really only do it for cases of like super high symmetry, like cylinders and spheres and boxes. And when you guys get to uh, the 300 level e &M, you'll do all three of them again, certainly. Um, and it'll sure. still be, say again? I was just going to ask for like surface integrals then they're basically um, always zero unless there's some like divergence either positive or negative. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So generically what you need is a source or sink. So if you wanted to use uh, Gauss's theorem in uh, fluid dynamics, you could draw all these surfaces in the ocean and they would all have net zero flux for an incompressible fluid because every molecule of H2O that pushes into the surface, it pushes one out. The only way to get an integral flux is if you have a sink, like, you know, water is draining in, out of the ocean for whatever reason, or a source. So water is pouring into the ocean. So which is where those terms come from. 
Yeah, so that's exactly right. So if you understand this, you understand Gauss's theorem perfectly. Um, cool. So let's do an example. Actually, let's do two examples because it's like really. Because if you do two examples, you really only have like two more, and you know everything there is to know about Gauss's law, honestly. Um, so let's take a sphere. And there are two ways of using Gauss's law. One is I give you the electric field. So this would be kind of the um, experimental or engineering way of doing it, is I give you an electric field and then you deduce something about the thing that caused it. So imagine that you're like an astrophysicist and you want to learn some properties of like, you know, a neutron star or a star or something like that. And then you kind of look at the electric and magnetic fields coming off of it, you would use an argument like this. What's going on inside based on what I can see? And then if you're a theorist, what you do, or an engineer, um, you create or suppose there's some cue enclosed and say like, what sort of electric field would this cause? Okay, so we'll just write one down and sort of learning by doing, because we're gonna really quickly move out of all boring cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so I know that this Newton's, Newton meter squared per C are the right units, um, because ultimately the SI units of the electric field are Newtons per Coulomb, it's defined as force per charge, or volts per meter, it's also okay. So those are why those units exist. Okay, so stop for a second. And the first thing we have to do is like visualize the electric field. What does the electric field look like? Okay, so these vectors have three properties I guess we could talk about. Do the vectors point inwards or outwards towards the center of the sphere or away from it? Because we're in radial coordinates. Away. So hidden in the minus sign. So you tell me some distance, like one meter away or something like that. And it's going to point in the, so pick a number one meter away. It's going to point in the radial direction, but then because of that negative sign, it's actually going to be the negative radial direction. So first thing is that these vectors point towards, so we'll draw a couple. What's the next property of this? And this is a sphere, so you can imagine them like coming in into the page towards the belly button of the sphere. What's the second thing I can deduce about this electric field? Let's say I go from one meter to two meters. What happens to my electric field lines or vectors? Four. Yeah, so they get, you go out by a factor of two, they get cut by a factor of four because of that squared. And this is the last one I'll draw. So these get really tiny really quickly. So this is roughly speaking what my electric field looks like. Okay, so what do you know about the charge enclosed in this sphere? Hopefully, yeah, hope, yeah, hopefully we get a negative number for Q enclosed. Okay. So let's write down Gauss's law.
And then what we're going to do, so we have the warning. Now I know that I got to actually kind of look some stuff up. I've got to look up what a piece of D sigma is in uh, spherical coordinates. So you have Gauss's law copied, so I can get rid of this. So what I need, D sigma, okay. For this surface, this closed surface, which way does D sigma point? So remember, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a so-called Gaussian surface. So I'm going to throw one of these fictitious bags over my charge. In order for this integral to be pleasant, I'm going to make it have the same symmetry as the thing itself. So remember, this would be true if we deformed this green bubble to have all sorts of lumps on it, but like that would be a giant chore. So I just want to throw a sphere over it. And because we're talking about an external electric field, my bag is going to be a sphere that's bigger than the surface itself. Okay. So I've got this Gaussian surface. It's outside of the sphere. And I want to look at a little piece of surface for it. So this is D sigma. And that's supposed to be a uh, sigma. Okay, so we got two questions. What's its direction and what's its magnitude? And then honestly, everything gets like really pleasant after that. Actually, a lot of multivariable calculus, the difficulty in it is like literally, or calculus in general, is just like writing down the integral. And then once you've got it written down, like usually things turn out to be not so hard, especially in the age of Wolfram Alpha. So which way does this point for a closed surface? It's uh, normal to the surface. Yes, and normal to the surface pointing inwards or outwards? Outwards. Got to be outwards because it's closed. So that was one of our two rules. So the this points outwards. Um, there are two ways that we could do this. One way that we could do this is just write down the answer. That's usually my preference, and I think most physicists' preference, is that this is a little, take a razor blade, cut out a little piece of this area. It looks like this. And what's true about this piece, so this is the way that spherical polar coordinates work. So we have this angle, theta, that goes starts at the North Pole and goes down we're at some distance r from here to here. And then this part, the azimuthal part, is what's given by theta. Okay, So those are the coordinates. Sorry, theta goes down from the North Pole, r is our distance from the origin, and phi is the azimuthal. So basically your um, longitude. Okay, the problem with these are that I cannot just say that d sigma is equal to d theta because it looks like this part is moving in the theta direction, d phi, right? These do not have the right units. What are the things that I need to put on them to give them the right units? So in order to get something that's unitful has units length from d theta, I've got to multiply it by what? So side view would look like this. So that's a little bit of d theta, and that's r. 
and the question is, don't worry that it's differential, but what is this arc length? You would need to convert between an angle and a length. So yep. some like trig function involving the radius of the sphere. So that's going to be, oh, it's going to be a hard picture to draw. So if I'm looking down at the North Pole, that's going to be true for the azimuthal one, because the farther down from the North Pole and bigger towards the equator, we're going to get bigger and bigger. So it, for instance, it takes 10 seconds to walk around the North Pole when you're at the North Pole. And it takes, I don't know, like a year or something like that to walk around the equator, if, walk around the North Pole if you're at the equator. So that's where the sign comes in. If you're looking from the side, this is this is d theta, and that's r. And then it's just like plain old ordinary arc length. So if I have an angle that's expressed in radians, and I have a length that's expressed in meters, what gives me my arc length ds along there? It would be a 2 pi r. Yeah, for the full circle, would be 2 pi r. But for a piece of it, exactly, so r d theta. Yeah, you did the hard one first. OK, so this is something that's got the right units. So our little piece of s coordinate full thing is not d theta, it's r d theta. OK, so that's this part. So this is r d theta. That's an actual length measured in meters. And then we'll go back over this as needed, but I'll just write down the answer for now. So imagine that, um, and also Alex basically gave the answer. So you're looking down at the North Pole. The farther down you are, the longer you have to walk. So that's the projecting of the sign. So I'll draw a side view of it. So let's say I'm here. I'm basically like at the Arctic Circle. Da, 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 da. I'm projecting down into this plane, and it's sine of theta, right? So the bigger sine of theta, the closer I am to the equator. So the other piece here is r sine theta, not all of r, just the sine part, because we're looking down, you know, closer you are to the equator, the longer you got to walk around the North Pole, d phi. So any questions about that? OK, that was work. And now everything else becomes pretty straightforward because we have things expressed properly. Everything's got the right dimensions. So this is our piece of d sigma. So writing it out in words, d sigma, the vector, is r d theta. So that's the theta part. And then r sine theta d phi. And then like a total clown, I'm going to write away from origin. But the way that shows up in these coordinates, we would call this r squared sine theta d theta d phi r hat. So that's the away from origin coordinate. Whew. OK, so now we're ready to do Gauss's law. Integral e dot d sigma over this closed surface, so that's a sphere. And then we'll leave that for a second. Do s for surface or sphere, dealer's choice leave off units and then put them back in at the end, but we know what the units are. Okay. R hat, R squared, dot, R squared, sine theta, d theta, d phi, R hat. Okay, we have R hat dotted with R hat, so nothing goes away, we're left with these things point in the same direction. And you know, now that we've done this right, we know that we have the correct surface element. 
you can be bold. You can just treat things like symbols. So r hat dot r hat, as long as we did the work of making sure everything has the right units and we have the right differential element, we're good. So r hat dot r hat is just multiply those two things. We don't have any theta hat. We don't have any um, phi hat. I feel like I'm at the dentist's office. Um, so I'm going to pull this constant out. We did our dot product. The R hats went away. Uh, this is really awesome. What happens with my R squared below and upstairs? They're gone. So I'm left with sine theta, d theta, d phi. This is looking really nice. OK, just like with the line or contour integrals, I have to actually express this. My two variables of integration are theta and phi. What's true about theta? What are the limits of theta in spherical coordinates? Zero to two pi, or zero to pi. Zero to pi. Start at the North Pole, end at the South Pole. What are my limits of longitude in spherical polar coordinates? You see to two pi, right? Exactly. Got to walk all the way around the North Pole. And then sine theta, um, d phi, d theta. I'm going to color code this because I really like doing that. Um, just so you know which integrals match with which. Hopefully, I don't erase all sorts of stuff I don't want to. Good. So the way you usually evaluate stuff is inner to outer. So if somebody in a multiple integral, I have 0 to 2 pi, it's going to be matched with the first integrand I see. right? So kind of like nested, nested parentheses structure. OK, any questions about anything that went on getting to that point? Good news is, is you'll get a ton of practice with both this particular physics of Gauss's law and ENM, and also we'll do a fair amount of multivariable calculus over the next month. Okay, sine theta has nothing to do with phi, so my inner integral just gives me a 2 pi. And I'll put these units back on. Um, so that's Newton meters squared per coulomb, and then 2 pi. Yeah. And then I'm left with 0 to pi, sine theta, d theta. And I either look at that or I squint and realize there's a really cool set of um, identities that I could use or look it up or Wolfram Alpha. Uh, the integral from 0 to pi of sine theta, d theta, anybody know offhand? Negative one, right? Cause it, or one, because it turns into negative cos or negative cosine. No, so I'm wrong. Nope, you're almost right. So yeah, it's just a number, but it's two. So we have four pi times minus ten thousand newton meter squared. So this is the flux integral. What does Gauss's law tell us? Gauss's law tells us that this is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And epsilon naught has units Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. So believe it or not, when I multiply by the 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th units, this actually turns out to be Coulombs. And just because leaving this problem here without finishing it would be kind of heartbreaking. Let me save this. And then let me. How did you get 4 pi? Um, so what I did is I just know that the integral of solid angle is 4 pi. Um, but the 
2 pi comes from the first integral and then integrals sine zero to pi should give me two. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, this is one of those, someday I'm gonna do this and be like embarrassingly wrong, but this is one of those ones that we'll get to and work a lot with. Actually, you might do this here in quantum, I forget. Sine theta d theta d phi over a sphere is four pi. So that's what's called the solid angle. That's actually how I remember that sine integral. I get it now, actually, four pi makes sense. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, so let's finish this and let's, um, let's erase this stuff. So four pi minus 10,000 Newton meters squared per Coulomb times 8.85 .8 times 10 to the minus 12th Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared, which is epsilon naught equals Q enclosed. And then Q enclosed is equal to 1.1 1 .1, um, microcoulomb. So this is kind of neat. We figured out how much charge was enclosed in the sphere. What's the thing that we absolutely do not know about this charge enclosed in the sphere? Which otherwise we would get so much for nothing. It would be like kind of, I don't know, wouldn't feel right, honestly. It would be like its location in the sphere or something? Precisely. So what we don't know is that if I were to cut the sphere in half, we have absolutely no idea about the radial distribution of it. So we know it's symmetric, like the electric field is symmetric, so the stuff inside is symmetric. But what I don't know is if I were to like cut this thing in half, what sort of distribution it would have. So you know absolutely nothing about this. So we could, for instance, have, um, we could have a lot of charge here at the surface and then like a solid core and then nothing in the middle or it could be the exact opposite. So we have no idea about the radial distribution. In fact, to me, this looks like the electric field of a point charge located at the origin that has 1.1 microcoulombs. So this is exactly what you would get if you just use plain old ordinary Coulomb's law for point charge. Right? And that point charge happened to be 1.1 microcoulombs. So Gauss's law is really useful, but there are certain things that it absolutely doesn't tell you. So any questions about that? Okay, so that's the whole program. A little bit of this is reminding ourselves of, um, you know, we did the hardest one. We actually didn't do the hardest one. You do like a parabolical, parabolic, um, hyperbolic coordinates or something like that. And you'll see one of those at least, I promise. We did spherical polar coordinates. So um, a good thing to do with the last 20 minutes is, Let's kind of replicate that process, but let's do it with cylindrical. And then in the last five minutes, we'll go over the answer, I guess. So And in this case, it's a really, really long cylinder. Um, when physicists say very long, it's slang for mathematically, you can treat it as infinite. And we'll call this the um, Q enclosed per length would be the um, charge length density. Just 
come up with something that looks a heck of a lot like the last thing we did. So we'll say the electric field. Um, what coordinates do you guys want to use for a cylinder? Cylindrical. Okay. If you gave the snarky answer, I'd actually make you do that in that coordinate system. But we'll call them rho, phi, z. And then this is going to be 5,000 extra bonus question. What are the units? And then this will be positive rho hat over rho. So first question is, what are the units of this? Shucks. So what are the units of the electric field? They're uh, Newton meters per coulomb. Yeah, we could do Newtons per coulomb. I'm going to do the other one. So the electric field could be in Newtons per coulomb. It's force per charge. Or it could be in volts per meter. And you're going to see why in a second uh, volts per meter is kind of a little bit more elegant. OK, so this whole thing on the left-hand side has to be in volts per meter but then we're also dividing and multiplying by stuff. Unit vectors are unitless, so that doesn't do anything. What does this need to be if we're dividing by meters in order to get volts per meter? The 5,000 just needs units of what? Just volts. Yeah, just volts. So Newton meters per coulomb is correct but volts is just a little bit easier. So if you wanted to use Newtons per coulomb, then you would have to put uh, meters upstairs because you're dividing by the row. OK, see if you can execute that entire program of using Gauss's law, which I will write down. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in this. And for us, it's just an example of how you would work in surface integrals. It's honestly like surface integrals and rectangular coordinates are just like way too easy. Um, so you may as well just jump into non-rectangular coordinates right now. Okay, I do want to leave time for questions. So I think now is probably a good time to go over this. So what we want is integral e dot d sigma, our nice surface integral. And because this is Gauss's law, um, if nothing else from 1220 stuck in your mind about Gauss's law, it should be that you got to pick a Gaussian surface, your choice. So this surface S, totally fictitious, totally up to you. But if you choose it, you got to choose it wisely, because if you don't, you actually have to do a serious surface integral. So what would be, this is my cylinder. This is about as best uh, I'm going to be able to draw all quarters. So behold my cylinder. And we have positive radially directed electric fields that get smaller like 1 over r. So might look something like this. So what would be the best Gaussian surface to pick? It would be a sphere, right? Still? Or a sphere might get you in trouble at the caps, or not at the caps, in between the caps and the sides. So let me, so let's say I had a sphere and this thing. Didn't want that. Um, so that's going to be a really good choice in two places. And then you're going to have trouble in the middle. So here, what's true about the normal or the surface element of the sphere and the electric field. They're uh, parallel. Yeah, so their dot product is just going to be their product. And then here, you also have a great situation where at the caps, which way does this field point relative to the normal? Also parallel. So in this case, the so the electric field is always radially directed, so always outwards. So here it's going to be easy and actually easier, but for the other reason is that you have a normal vector d sigma pointing up, and then this field is always in the radial direction, so it's always going to point out. 
So in that case, I get zero. So I like the sphere there and there, but then what happens somewhere in the middle? So then I get in trouble because now I have a uh, electric field that's pointed radially outwards, but then I have a normal that's pointed at some like funky angle. So you can do that. It's not impossible. And I see why you're asking about the, yeah, the other issue is exactly, I guess the question you're asking was like, wait a minute, what do I do once I get inside the, the sphere or the cylinder? Yeah. Well, yeah, I that's have to the cylinder. I was just thinking, I don't know. I thought it might be a good idea to have a sphere and close the entire thing. And it would, that way you wouldn't have to worry about angles, but I forgot about the radially directed electric field. So. Yeah, it's ultimately it's the, the relative angle in between the electric field and the surface. So what you end up choosing is a Gaussian surface that is basically the same shape as the electric field. And if it doesn't point exactly in the direction of the electric field, having it be perpendicular would be a great choice. So at first, actually, the cylinder seems like it might have some issues, actually. So let me draw a Gaussian cylinder. And so we care about the external electric field. So this thing's outside of the cylinder. So here, everything looks great because E field points out, and then the cylinder itself, the normal, points out. Here up at the top, at first blush, I'm like, ah, maybe this is a problem because I have a area integral, the ds, or differential element, the d sigma, that points up. But then does that turn out to be a problem? No, because this is radially directed. So in that case, just like here, zero because they're perpendicular. So in general, I mean, honestly, in general, what you do is you memorize the three examples of Gauss's law for perfect symmetry, or four examples, if you include the torus. And then you just know which one to use. So any questions about why that would be probably the best? I mean, the reason I know it's the best is because I've solved this problem like 10 times. But so the argument behind why that's the best Gaussian surface to choose OK, so just like the line integral, we have two parts of this, in fact. We have two parts of the Gaussian surface. We have the label of the soup can, but then we also have the end caps. I'll write down the element for the caps anyway, but what can you tell me about this entire integral? where the goal of physics is to do as little work as possible. If the electric field is only radially directed, then it's not going to have any component um, on the cap side. Exactly, right? So the at the caps, if I use my definition of little area element, we have a closed surface, so they point normal, but they point outward normal. Wouldn't matter if they pointed inward normal. But they point in the positive or negative z direction, and the electric field only points in the row direction. So this is k hat, and this is rho hat. And when I dot k hat and rho hat, I get no hat. So that whole term goes to 0, because the area differential element and the electric field are perpendicular. So they technically exist. So you might even find like a textbook that like kind of just mumbles something about the caps. We do have a closed surface, need to have a closed surface. So we do have them. So all that's left are the labels. And we have E dot D sigma. So that was the hard um, kind of philosophical part where you actually have freedom to choose stuff instead of just crunching through numbers. Um, once you choose the right Gaussian cylinder in this case, you're, you're guaranteed to do the right computation if you put the right stuff in at least. So now what we need is we have E, we need to express D sigma. So what is D sigma for the label of this like soup can thingy? 
So I want an area plaquette that like, looks like this, and then we have uh, the sigma that points out. So let's do top view. So top view, I have this part, and there's row, and then there's a little bit of DeFi. So what is that? Row DeFi. DeFi, exactly right. And then we have this part that goes up and down. So this is the side view already. So what is that? I mean that DZ. Um, it is, right? Okay. So that's just up and down. That is literally just DZ. And it's already got the right units. So we know that the sigma in all its glory, it has magnitude rho d phi. That has units in SI of meters. So we know that's good. DZ, that has SI units of meters. And then what direction does this surface element point? In the uh, row direction. Yes, so row hat, which is good because you know we've got to, you know we're going to dot it with something that's d row. If it were anything but d row, we just like we wouldn't have an integral at all. And I know this thing has an electric field that's pointed outwards that looks like a source. I better have some some contribution to this integral. Okay. So any questions about that stuff? So now we have integral ds, e dot d sigma. OK, just the label. So we have the e part. I'll just write the 5,000 volts, leave the units on. And then row hat over row. And then we're dotting that with row d phi dz row hat. And then, well. So this is no longer closed because we got rid of the caps. So this is just the label. Okay. Now I have row downstairs, row upstairs, rows are gone, row hat dot row hat, which means I just end up with the thing itself. So I have 5,000 volts comes out. And then I have, oops, the row is gone. And I have d phi dz. And that's it. So what are the limits on phi for this coordinate system? Zero to two pi. Zero to two pi. OK, what are the limits on z? No idea. So let's call them 0 to L. So we end up with 5,000 volts times 2 pi times L. But what we wanted was charge per length. Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So that's the left-hand side of Gauss's law. So we have exactly what we wanted. Q enclosed, putting length on the other side is 2 pi times 5,000 times 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th. That's epsilon naught. And then too lazy to calculate that. But what should my answer's units be? And it turns out that they're correct. Coulombs per meter. OK, so this is the good news, is that no comparison surface integrals are the toughest, because the surface differential element itself is a vector. Volume element is a scalar. Line element is also a vector, but it's a easy to deal with vector. Um, this thing is. You know, worse defined through cross product. So this, I think, is the grittiest stuff that we'll do for the next, like, I don't know, week. Integral calculus is always tougher. 
Okay, so if we need more practice with that, I'm happy to like record some uh, some more examples and throw them up. Just ask in the discussion board or by email. Um, we'll do volume integrals next, and then I'll probably record some of the meanings of what these derivatives mean geometrically, like the equivalent for single variable calculus of d by df dx is limit as delta x goes to zero of difference of vectors divided by delta x. Those things have meanings for um, divgrad and curl, and sometimes it's useful to know what they are. So you could think about that as like a kind of auxiliary theory lecture that I'll put up. So it's worth seeing it, but you know, I won't ask you guys to do proofs. Right. Um, so if anybody has other questions, I am happy to stick around for a while, but otherwise I'll see you guys on Tuesday. And remember that the last half hour of class will be the first quiz. Well, cool. thank you. Right. Yeah, have a good weekend. Uh, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, I was having difficulty on that last example you did, trying to figure out how